Hello everyone, Earl Henderson, Primordial Defense. Thank you for watching. I have another Monday quarterback video for you. I'm gonna play this video and talk about things that are going on to better explain what's going on and talk about things that I think that are being done right and or done wrong. Without further ado, here we go. Richmond 911, what is the address of your emergency? Um, I, I'm not at the emergency. An old employee of mine just told me that he killed his wife. His name's James Calverty. Richmond 911, what is the address of your emergency? It's at, um, one, hold on a second. One, one, zero, zero, Evergreen. Yeah. Yeah, so you should have just received a phone call from the same incident, but you did not have the address. Uh, one of our employees uh, made a phone call to my chef. I'm the owner of the business, uh, saying that he shot his wife, killed his wife, and is now driving around in his car with three guns. What is he driving? Uh, silver F Ford F-150. It's a single-door cab, extended bed. Okay, so <clears throat> not a whole lot of footage for this video, um, but we'll go with it. Uh, there is some inter interesting information about this guy. Uh, this guy was previously convicted of murder once before and sent to prison. Uh, I'll talk about that more at the end of the video because that'll kind of go into a rant. So... Uh, I had read an article, and I don't know which site it came from. I, I tried to bring it back up, but I couldn't find it. Um, but uh, this is a, a newlywed. I think they've been married for not even a year, maybe half a year at most. Um, I don't know how long they were seeing each other before getting married, uh, but they are, quote-unquote, newlyweds. Um, domestic violence is 
something that occurs everywhere in the world. And there are, you know, varying degrees of, you know, domestic violence. Um, you know, it can, some of it can be, uh, pure emotional. Um, it could be physical. And when it gets physical, it can be varying forms of physical. Um, it can be, uh, what some would call just, you know, like gripping someone by the arm and forcibly pulling them somewhere, uh, maybe a little bit of pushing and can be going all the way as far as being as drastic as full on punching in the face, kicking, hitting with objects, etc. Um, domestic disturbances, they occur everywhere uh, and with all social classes. Uh, it's something that so many, so many people experience and go through. It's not like it's unique to just, you know, one set of group of people or, or anything like that. Um, when you look at the historical perspective, historical perspective of officers being injured or killed, there's a lot of officers who are injured and killed from domestic disturbance calls. So officers have to be uh, very alert um, and very on top of things when going to these type of calls because history has shown that they can be quite deadly. Um, people uh, in these domestic uh, disputes, they are people who are not thinking rationally. Uh, they are doing things that they ordinarily would not do under any other times. The emotions that people experience and go through when it's involving love and thing like and things like that, um, or jealousy or you know other things, it's almost like like how fear can rob a person of all their logical thinking, like true fear, like someone just like totally scared to death, um, they will not think reasonably under under those conditions, and people experiencing. Uh, the emotional duress and stuff that they experience in these domestic things are a little bit similar in some way. Like people become so enraged uh, in some things and just are not thinking clearly and they can really, really go crazy. Um, no idea, um, you know, what could have led into this. Uh, you know, this guy could have been like this from the get-go. Um, as I said, he was previously convicted once of murder, and I'll talk about that later. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what caused it, but it, it happened. Um, and that's and that's something that people need to think about. Um, think about you know some of those warning signs and some of the things that people are doing that could lead into if they're going to be a domestic abuser or not. Um, some people don't show their hands until after a little bit and, um, you know, the other person is already caught up in the, you know, falling in love and all that. And then when the thing happens, they start making excuses, you know, well, maybe I should have cooked dinner a little earlier, you know, maybe I should have done this. I should have done that. Maybe I set them off, blah, 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 blah. And it can be really hard to reason with those people like, Hey, no, you're not doing a damn thing wrong. Like, this person's an asshole. <laughs> Leave them. Um, and then the whole aspect of, of leaving someone in, you know, if, you know, they're living together, you know, they're stuck. Like, where are they going to go? They're going to become homeless. Um, kind of like the same way when people talk about their jobs and stuff. And, and then you got these people, well, just quit. Like, not everyone can just quit their damn job and spend the weeks or days or even months that it could take to get a new one, you know, going through the job searching process, the interviews and all that. It's not like you can just quit and bam, start a new one the same day. Some people can on, you know, but those are not going to be, um, very reputable jobs. You know, it's going to be some, uh, manual labor, low skill kind of stuff that you can just quit a job and start another one, another one right then and there. Um, so people in, in these living conditions, you know, they're, where are they going to go if they decide, all right, I'm not going to stay with, uh, 
the abuser here. I'm gonna I'm gonna move out. Well, where are you gonna move to? If you got family who can take you in, great. What if you don't have any family nearby? Um, what if your family doesn't have the ability to take you in? Friends, same thing. I mean, you may have some friends, but are they going to let you stay in their house for a long period of time? Don't know. Um, and you, and there's some people who are very thoughtful and, and caring, and they don't want to put their friends and family in those positions of having to house them and stuff like that. And so they sit there and they endure all that crap. <clears throat> it sucks. It really does. Um, moving on from there. So uh, police respond to the house um, where the murder has occurred. Uh, they actually get there and uh, they end up transporting transporting her to the hospital. And then she is pronounced dead at the hospital. So... Um, I've talked about this before about the pronouncing of death. So sometimes it can be done at the scene. Sometimes it's done later at the hospital when the coroner finally arrives there. Uh, so some places you have to go by what the coroner says. That's what's on the official stuff. Um, other places they can kind of do it right then and there on the scene. Um, so it could be that she was completely you know, pretty much dead there at the house, but they worked her and took her to the hospital trying to revive her and then just couldn't get it done and then called it quits there. Uh, or she could have been um, still alive at the house and they transported her, but she was just too far gone to be able to, to sustain life. Um, And it's hard to, to speculate anything about that because I don't know anything about her injuries or, or anything like that. But let's just hypothetically say that he shot her and uh, she was still able to physically move and stuff. But she was just kind of laying on the ground bleeding out. Um, if that was the case, I would, I would imagine she probably would have called 911. Um, but, you know, just for, you know, hypothetical sake, say she was still somewhat conscious maybe she just wasn't able to crawl away or anything like that but could maybe you know do some stuff for herself that's where having a good foundation of medical knowledge could come in handy to save yourself uh, knowing medicine knowing uh, medical care is not just for people in that kind of profession it should be for everyone uh, you are your own first responder. You will 100% always be the first one at your own emergency. So you need to be able to deal with emergencies. Some of you watching this channel are gun people, so you may already have the gun box checked off. Do you have the medical box checked off? If you If you don't, you need to fix that. If you carry a gun for a living, you need to carry medical equipment for a living as well. So he pulls into this place. It's a pizza grill. So in the earlier uh, 911 call, the guy talked about, you know, the employment and there's a chef or something there that this guy called. So this is a place that would have a chef, but I just don't know if this is the place that was being referred to in that 911 call. Uh, so I have no idea if that dude works here or not, but it's interesting that he pulled into this parking lot of this uh, pizza grill place. So was he there just to go in and grab a bite to eat? Did you know the act of murdering his wife work up his appetite or something? Or is this the place where um, he works at and he was going to go in and you know maybe kill someone else? Um, you know, the, the wife situation was his wife seeing someone there, you know, was he, did he find out about it? Did he kill her for it? And now he's going to kill someone else. Does he just tired with life, tired of her decide, you know what? Wife's gone, going away for the rest of the life. Uh, might as well go take out some other people I got grudges against and go to work. I don't know. I have no idea. I wish they would have provided a little bit more detail and context about the location here. But it is interesting to me that um, uh, it's a food place, and the 911 call talked about you know him being an employee and, and the chef, and every, or not him being the chef, but uh, him calling a chef and talking to the chef. So the police car 
was driving along his two-man car and they happened to notice the suspect vehicle. They make their little U-turn right there, kind of an intersection, and then they come in like Leroy Jenkins. So I'd imagine the passenger probably saw him and was like, hey, there he is, there he is. And uh, gets turned around and Leroy Jenkins. So that right there to me was a totally stupid move. Um, why the hell would you just rush in there like that past the person so that when you come to a stop, now your backside is to them? Like that was just not a good move, in my opinion. Um, if they're gonna make that U turn and come around, then I think that parking your squad in the middle of the road is a viable option. There's a reason why you got flashy lights on that damn car. It's to warn other motorists, um, and you would be putting yourself in a better position so that you would have engine block and stuff like that to the front of you uh, in the case, in the event that this guy starts shooting. You can take better cover, whereas right now, as soon as he opens his door, what what is exposed to the bad guy? His backside. Like this bad positioning here. Um, I don't know anything about this agency. I don't know if they keep rifles up in the cab of the vehicle or not. Uh, but you know, this call has come out. Uh, you know, the guy shot his wife. Police have gone to the house. They found the wife there. They know that something has you know definitely happened like that. And now everyone's on the lookout for this dude. Um, the minute that they spotted this dude, um, if, and this is speaking, if the rifle is in the front cab of the vehicle, if the rifle is in the front cab of the vehicle, what should have immediately happened is that passenger should have started uh, to disengage that rifle from its mounting system, charge it, and get that thing ready for the fight. Now, if the rifle is in the cargo hold of the vehicle, Obviously, that's going to be uh, difficult for the officer to get it out and charge it while they're still driving because uh, it's going to be in the back, uh, locked up. If they were assigned to be looking for this guy, they weren't going to other calls then I think that if the rifle was in the back of the car, then the passenger should have been riding around with the rifle up front with them as they're going around searching for this guy because they have no idea if they're going to come across him or not. And if they do, you need to get that rifle out and put it in play as quick as possible. Now, if they were on, you know, regular assignment, they were just, you know, still, you know, they're still, you know, keep an eye out on things but they're still subject to call you know they could you know they could help they could have been on the way to a call right then and there uh you don't know um if they were still subject to call i could see maybe it being a little difficult uh for them to um ride around with a rifle up front i think it's still something that could have been done and if you got to the call of the missing juvenile or something like that then as soon as you get out of the car you can go secure the rifle in the back like it don't it don't take that much to go you know open a cargo door and put something in the cargo area and then close the the hatch itself so still think he could have been riding shotgun so to speak with the rifle if they had one in the car this is the only thing we see from this officer right here and he has a weapon malfunction that sucks like how crappy is it to get a weapons malfunction in the middle of a freaking gunfight we can't really see a whole lot with what's going on with it we can tell that it is a, a gun that has a red dot sight on it um, it does not appear as though he has one of those um, plus two extensions or you know plus three five whatever extensions on the bottom of his magazine it appears to be a normal stock magazine in the gun itself uh, don't know for sure what type of malfunction he had I don't know if he went to fire the thing and it didn't work or if he did fire it and he got a 
a stove pipe or a double feed. I, I don't know what has occurred here. It it's so fast with the footage, and it's hard to to get things to pause just right. So what I'll do is. go down to the playback speed slow it down really super quick we'll see if we can get some better oh crap that's way too fast <laughs> I'm sorry wrong uh, wrong selection there all right so we'll skip forward 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 skip forward, skip forward. all right Still can't see very well what the heck's going on with this gun. So it's really hard to tell for sure, but it almost looks like as he is presenting the gun, he fires. And we see the slide in a rear position, and we see what looks like a smoke plume coming out. So it looks like as he is as he has drawn his gun, and he's bringing his gun up into full presentation, he fires a round off before getting your good quintessential two-handed grip. So that is a technique that can be done um it's not something that you know new beginners learn right off the bat or anything like that um but it is something that can be done um does it mean that you're not using your sights yes it means you're not using your sights um but it is something that can be done to start putting rounds down range uh very quickly at a threat so it's possible that as he has done this, um, a stovepipe has occurred, a, a type two malfunction. We see what looked like the slide still being stuck in a rearward position as he went to go rack it. And it's still in a rearward position. So it's even possible that he has experienced a double feed. That sucks ass. So as he's going, he's ejecting magazine out of the gun. And he, I guess, starts to uh, work that slide to clear that malfunction. So based off what I could see, which... You can see it's not a whole lot. I think he might have had a double feed malfunction. Uh, double feed malfunctions, type 3 malfunctions really suck. Um, they're not quick and easy to, to solve. You can't just do a tap rack on them. Uh, you got to do, you know, a couple extra steps. Uh, worst kind of freaking malfunction you could have in the middle of a gunfight. Uh, he did the right thing. He, uh, he moved off the X. Like, you're not going to stand there fix your gun while someone's shooting at you like that's not, not going to work so he moved his feet got moving did the nike drill and uh, worked his gun as he went to move towards cover all right we'll come out of slow speed go back to normal and we'll see his buddy Maybe not. Here we go. All right. So partner comes out of the car, presents gun, and drops the bad guy. 
He too has a red dot on his gun. And he also appears to have a uh, normal factory magazine in the gun. He gets his sights on target. And he stops the threat. This guy's a little too late to the party. Looks like a cell phone down here and a revolver. So, um, this guy is a convicted felon because he was convicted of murder once before. Uh, if he is a convicted felon, how is he getting a gun? Uh, well, uh, that newlywed um, could have been the one who bought the gun. And I don't know that for sure. It's just a speculation or throwing out a possibility. But the newlywed could have bought that gun. And if she did... It's kind of a odd thing to think about that she bought her own murder weapon. Um, and it could have been hers too. She could have had a gun um, and he could have gotten it and used it against her. Um, which is also something odd to, to really think about like being killed with your own your own gun. Uh, he, he could have been he could have been having it. He could have had it for a while after getting out of prison. Um, I want to say that within the last five years was when he was released from prison. So he could have had family members buy him one. He, he could have had uh, friends go out and buy one. People who didn't have felony convictions, they could have gone to a gun store and bought one. Now, the act of doing that is a crime. That's straw purchasing. Um, unfortunately, it's something that uh, someone can... Um, in a lot of cases um, say that they didn't know with this particular thing this guy having been uh, convicted of murder and been in prison for a very long time I think it would be pretty difficult to say that a family member would be able to come up with that kind of excuse like oh I didn't know he was a felon really well where has he been at for the last 20 fucking years uh prison a ding 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 um now, he could have had some new friends or something, you know, uh, that, you know, he could have got them to go buy one from the gun store and, and, and whatnot. Um, it's those kind of things that I really wish that the courts would fully pursue and charge people to the full extent on, prosecute to the full extent on. Uh, we've got these gun laws in place, but a lot of times they're not, they're not fully utilized or, you know, people are not fully sentenced on them the way they should. <clears throat> this guy, um, let me bring up the uh, article, or not the article, but the, um, the information here. So he was previously convicted of murder. So I'm going to law.justia.com where he has tried to uh, appeal his conviction. Uh, James Edgar Talbert III was convicted in a bench trial of second-degree murder uh, use of a firearm in the commission of a murder and in violation of being in possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. On May 10... 2000, Talbert went to Daryl Farrow's apartment to pick up some mail. The two had been roommates. Uh, knowing the neighborhood to be a high crime area frequented by drug dealers and having been robbed twice in the area, he placed a handgun in his back pocket. 
Talbert was a previously convicted felon. Arriving at Farrow's apartment, Talbert collected his mail and began looking at some photos that Farrow had taken. While he was looking at the photos, Farrow made sexual advances toward him, attempting to fondle, fondle his genital area. Talbert told Farrow to stop. Farrow then asked to perform oral sex on him. Talbert refused and pulled the handgun out of his back pocket. Struggling for the weapon, the two men fell onto a sofa. The handgun discharged, and Farrow suffered a fatal gunshot wound to the chest. Talbert fled the apartment and drove to Shanna Harvey's apartment on North 35th Street. Before entering her apartment, he discarded the handgun. From Harvey's apartment, Talbert contacted the Richmond Police Department and reported that he had witnessed Farrow's shooting. He offered to provide information. Soon thereafter, Detectives Joyce Payne and Lloyd Redford arrived at Harvey's apartment. When the detectives arrived, they asked Talbert what had happened. According to Detective Redford, Talbert told me that he had been to visit a friend. While he was in there, he was in the back bedroom. He heard a knock at the door. Two gentlemen came in, and he heard one of them tell the victim, give it up. Another one appeared in the doorway of the back bedroom, scuffled with him. One of them tried to take the ring off his finger, and he got away and ran out the door. Talbert told the detectives that while fleeing, he heard a gunshot. He then jumped into his truck and drove away. Detective Redford went to Farrow's apartment and then returned to Harvey's apartment. The detectives asked Talbert and Harvey to, to accompany them to the police station to put their statements on tape. Detective Payne told Talbert that he did not have to go to the station. Detective Payne said, this is totally on your own if you would like to come down. Talbert and Harvey agreed to go and rode with the detectives to the police station. At the police station, Harvey was interviewed first. During her interview, which lasted 20 to 30 minutes, Talbert waited outside the interview room where he watched by a uniformed officer, where he was watched by a uniformed officer. Talbert's interview began at approximately 5 a.m. The detectives asked him um, initially whether he minded talking with them. He replied, okay. The interview room was small and was equipped with a round table and four chairs. Talbert sat at the table. Initially, the door was closed. Detectives Payne and Redford and Sergeant Walker questioned Talbert for approximately an hour and a half to two hours. At various times, Talbert was questioned by one, two, or all three officers, and the door was open. At no time was he told he was not free to leave. While questioning Talbert, the police began to doubt his story because of inconsistencies between his account and the physical evidence. Talbert said four men struggled in the apartment, but the damage was inconsistent with that claim. Talbert also said he ran out of the apartment's back door, but there were no fingerprints on the back door. Approximately halfway through the interview, Detective Payne began considering whether Talbert should be a suspect. The officers told Talbert repeatedly that what he was saying did not match the evidence and that he needed to be truthful. About an hour into the interview, Detective Redford decided Talbert was holding back something, but he didn't know what. After Talbert was told that the evidence suggested that only he and Farrow had been in the apartment and that a gunshot residue test would show that he fired the gun, he recanted his story. He explained that the gun had discharged accidentally when he and Farrow were scrambling over it. The following ensued. Talbert we got to talking when I got there. Didn't want to. It wasn't supposed to happen. Redford, I'm sure it wasn't. What happened? Talbert, it accidentally went off. Redford, the gun accidentally went off. Won't nobody in there other than the two of y'all, right? Talbert, yeah. We won't gone be no shooting. That ain't supposed to happen. We were scrambling and he just squeezed my hand and it went off. At that point, Talbert had not been advised of his Miranda rights. Talbert was then handcuffed. A gunshot residue test performed, and was performed and questioning continued. Talbert told the police that he had left the handgun at an abandoned house on North 35th Street near his girlfriend's apartment. The police took Talbert and Harvey back to the North 35th Street. Their purpose was to take Harvey home and to locate the handgun. As they were waiting for a key to the abandoned house where Talbert said he had left the gun, Harvey pointed to Patrick Henley, who was walking down the street, and said he had the handgun. Without being asked, Talbert confirmed this. Henley fled and threw the handgun in a storm drain, from which it was recovered. 
The police searched the abandoned house but found no weapon. Forensic tests identified the handgun discarded by Henley as the weapon that killed Farrow. On Talbert's pretrial motion, the trial court suppressed his statements following the portion uh, recited above. However, it refused to suppress and received into evidence the recited portion of his statements and the handgun. It ruled that handgun had been found as a result of Harvey's statement, not as a result of Talbert's statement to the police. Um, so it goes on to, to talk about a little bit more. Uh, he did waive his right to a jury trial, testified, and was convicted of second-degree murder. Um, then the other charges, it goes on to talk about the motion to suppress confession. Uh, talks about some case law relating to some of this stuff. Motion to suppress the firearm and some other little tidbits here and there. So, um, he got sent to prison, spent a long time in there, and like I said, I think it was within the last five years he was released from prison. So, I guess he, uh, you know, did his time, served his sentence. Uh, he either, uh, he either served the entire sentence like he was supposed to, or he might have gotten parole. I, I don't know which one of those ha had to have occurred. Um, if he served his entire sentence, then um, I think it's wrong that he didn't have much longer time given to his sentence. Uh, murder is murder. Um, you need to be in for life if you're going to be murdering people like you should not be getting out um, if he was put on parole um, that's another problem um, if you're in for murder and you're given a certain amount of time as a sentence then you should do that sentence you should not get out early just because you had good behavior just because you completed a class or two this getting out on good behavior shit is bullshit uh, you need to be on good behavior because if not then what should be happening is if you have bad behaviors while you're in prison you should just have extra time added to your sentence completing classes and stuff in prison I think is kind of bullcrap like a substance abuse program uh, so inmates can can go to a substance abuse program they can take an anger management kind of class or some other stuff and when they complete these classes they get time shaved off of their sentence so they go to a class and they can get like three months off their sentence if they complete a substance abuse program or something like that kind of think that's bullshit um i mean it is and these are attend only kind of classes like all you got to do is show up like there's no grueling uh, tests or you know you got to maintain certain GPA yada 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 it's like you, you fucking show up you pass how hard is that to do when you're in prison like what else is on your schedule to go do what fucking conflicting things <laughs> and responsibilities do you have in prison oh shit I can't make this class today I gotta go play checkers with Bob like you're in prison dude attending classes should not get you time shaved off the criminal justice system has has basically become a joke in my opinion um, especially for the courts and the correction side of things um, the general public is being is being given a, a bad hand in this uh, the general public is being victimized when things like this happen because these criminals they get back out and they reoffend they re-victimize more people all right so not much else to talk about if you like what you hear and see go ahead and give me a like and a share if you haven't already hit the subscribe button and stay tuned for more monday quarterback videos earl henderson primordial defense thank you for watching